Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Cinematic Conversations. We have a, a very different kind of program tonight, which is going to be really exciting. Um, our guest host tonight is Jessica Green. Jessica, how are you? Hi. Hi, Bart. So um, for those who don't know Jessica, she's the artistic director of the Houston Cinema Art Society. So what is this Houston Cinema Art Society, Jessica? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's so much fun to be here. Yeah, the Houston Cinema Arts Society is um, a intersectional organization in Houston. Uh, we put on the largest film festival in Houston, the Houston Cinema Arts Festival. This year will be November 11th to the 22nd. Really excited about that. And the theme is the Third Coast. So we're going to go super Texas mm -hmm. um, this year, um, which should be a lot of fun. And we also do year-round programming, year-round exhibition programming, and field building work, filmmaker development work. We have a couple of filmmaker competitions um, and we're building on that work. We do a conference uh, for uh, Texas-based black filmmakers every year. So combination of exhibition programming and filmmaker development, field development, um, really trying to help be a part like you of developing you know, filmmaking in Texas and follow your lead and just continue that charge of um, you know, just helping make Houston, a place where people can live and make films, hopefully increasingly more in the future. The, the, the festival you put on is just absolutely amazing and has grown so much over the years and it reaches so many different kinds of audiences in so many different kinds of ways. Um, it's really kind of amazing the, the breadth of it and the depth and the great uh, programming and we're really excited to, to to see what comes up in the fall. You wanna talk about CineSpace, which I think is a really kind of unique collaboration that um, the organization has been doing for what, three or four years maybe? Yeah, no, totally. Well, apropos of your background and my Hello Kitty astronaut, I gotta move my head the <laughs> other way back, go Hello Kitty astronaut. Um, yeah, so CineSpace is a competition, short film competition um, in partnership with NASA. And it is uh, um, filmmakers um, submit films that are based on NASA archives, which is vast. NASA has been documenting NASA's work since NASA started. So there's an incredible archive of film, video, you know, so much content. And um, you know, the um, competition has a you know cash prize attached, and we are accepting submissions now. Um, for the CineSpace competition. So that is up on our website, cinemahtx.org, cinemahtx.org. Uh, you know, please, you know, take a look and um, submit your films to this incredible competition. And then we show the films, um, you know, uh, we show the finalists in this Houston Cinema Arts Festival. Um, and excitingly, Rick Linklater makes the final call. He is our final judge par excellence, who is also on our board. Um, and yeah, it's just a great, you know, excellent competition and uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so the thing is, make a great film, Rick could see it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, just, you know, in looking over your bio, there are some interesting things. So you're, uh, you're creating a series for Stanley Nelson, who's like, first of all, I love Stanley Nelson's films. All of his films are just, truly absolutely magnificent and all the work he's doing with firelight media is just amazing in terms of empowering people teaching people having like passing on to a new generation of filmmakers a truly for sure incredible human but you are you are working on this series called films by fire so what is yeah this series? actually that series um i i think i need to make sure my bios are updated sorry about that that series actually passed i did that already but that was great that was um yeah, I mean, Firelight Media um, and Firelight Films. Firelight Films is his production company. You know, the films that he produces um, come out of Firelight Films. And Firelight Media is just this incredible, you know, again, back to this, like, how do we support artists? How do we support filmmakers? How do we support emerging artists? How do we support underrepresented artists? How do we support artists of color? Um, so this is, you know, um, Firelight Media is focused on that, providing guidance, support, mentorship, for um, emerging, you know, um, BIPOC filmmakers. And this series was a compilation of um, several of the filmmakers that have come out of their lab, um, you know, and it's just an incredible, um, you know, just family of filmmakers, um, you know, consistently they've had like, I don't know, somewhere between, you know, 
four to six films between Stanley's mm. films and the films out of the lab that have been in Sundance, which, you know, is no easy feat, right? Yeah, I mean, for yeah. one organization to have several films in Sundance pretty much annually, you know, speaks to the quality of the filmmaking. And I would just add about Stanley, you know, he's obviously in hot demand right now, right? Like, you know, there's something blowing in the wind. A lot has happened. A lot of awarenesses, right, have emerged in this last year, um, especially. And I think he's somebody who has been doing for a long time what many other people are opening their eyes to yeah. in terms of what he centers, what he privileges, the perspectives that he allows for, the kind of diverse perspectives in his documentaries. Um, you know, one of my favorite films that he did is the documentary about Jim Jones. Just that is from the- really Yeah, incredible. which is just phenomenal. And just, yeah. you know, yeah, just opened, just really reframed the whole, the whole scenario. And really, um, and from the perspective of Jim Jones's son, who I think was the first African-American kid adopted by a white person in the state of Indiana. So it's really, really complex story, um, mm -hmm. really complicated. In fact, many people don't know this, Jim Jones actually made sure that his kids got out before everybody, you know, took the Kool-Aid, whatever the flavor aid, whatever it was called. So, you know, it's a, yeah. Well, actually it was flavor aid. That's, yeah. a, that's oh. a, one of the myths of, yeah. It's like everybody wanted to brand it, but it wasn't the good stuff. It was, you know, if you're gonna, you know, I shouldn't make a bad joke, but you know, like why go for the brand of, yeah. So right. anyway, so, but it's just like a really nuanced, you know, complex portrait, right? Of the early days in San Francisco, what yeah. the People's Church was trying to do and just how it all curdled and really fell apart, you know, through this one man's mania. Um, and that's just, you know, one example of many films that he's made. He's made a very, um, you know, seminal Black Panther documentary that's- Very important um, and yeah, important to and, see now. Yeah, really and just so many, so many films and everybody that's, you know, part of, uh, yeah, Firelight Media, part of the lab is just, you know, following in those footsteps, but from all these different perspectives and vantage points and with all these different lenses, you know, um, you know, indigenous lenses, you know, Asian, you know, just so queer, Latinx, you know, so many different perspectives. Um, and he, and they're really, last thing I would say is that they're really intentional around like, no, no, like use your story, use your personal background, don't hide from it, don't run from it, don't be, you know, so overly concerned about this idea of, um, you know, journalistic objectivity, right? I mean, objectivity is sort of questionable, you know, to a certain extent. Anyway, so- um, so, so, they so where really, yeah. can the series be seen? Well, the series already passed. It took place, that series took place um, in New York City. Yeah. Um, so that that is of the past. It was in person. Um, it took place uh, in New York City, largely in Harlem. I did a program at the Apollo of the film Mr. Soul. That's that's a film that came out yeah. of, which is an incredible. I don't know, are you familiar with that we, film, we, Melissa? We Hayes showed was? that. Yes, yeah. we did. Isn't it amazing? We had her here too. It was, it was yeah, great. she's incredible, right? Powerhouse. Yeah. I mean, oh. oh my God, what an amazing, an amazing woman. So that was great. We did a program there. We had Black Ivory, the singing group, Blair Underwood. Um, yeah, it was it was just incredible. Um, yeah. So, so speaking of, of Harlem, the, the other thing, and we're not going to spend the whole time going over all, over all the things you've yeah, done, yeah. But, but the idea that you were the director of the Maisel's Documentary Center, I mean, I, Al is like a very, you know, major hero in my life. And I, I, I know that there, there is this thing, I've never been to it, but I, that, that you were, you know, running it for a long time. Can you tell us a little bit about what goes on there? Yeah, yeah. I was the um, cinema director yeah. of the Maisel's Documentary Center, and I ran the exhibition programming there. And yeah, it's an incredible um, community center for, you know, documentary filmmakers, both, again, very focused on, I mean, that's, you know, I think where a fair amount of my grounding comes in terms of, you know, just really keeping your eyes on this twin prize, right, of like, exhibition, you know, audience, you know, audience cultivation, but then what are, what are we doing to cultivate the filmmakers? What are we doing to support the artists and the development, you know, of their work? So um, Mills Documentary Center is both a movie theater and a training center for documentary filmmakers, um, um, some very young documentary filmmakers. There are some incredible youth documentary programs there for young people, you know, in the community in Harlem, young people where obviously there is tremendous barrier to entry, um, you know, and, you know, we're talking about a world, right, the world of film where it doesn't hurt to have some privilege, right, um, and it can be harder if you don't, you know, to figure out how to find your way. So, um, you know, this is a, a great um, center and program 
and um, it's still going to this day. I mean, they're right now they're they're running virtually, you know, because of the pandemic. But I think they will be getting up in person um, soon, like many other places. But they're still, you know, continuing to do incredible programming, um, both for young filmmakers and for you know audience. Um, and it's all documentary um, based. Um, and, and yeah, and Albert and I worked with Albert for seven years and yeah. learned a lot from him, and he was incredible and. He was as incredible. I mean, you know, you you he came to Dallas, right? And you he, guess, he, you know, he came here for yeah. many years. And yeah, I got to hang out with him. It's one of the great joys of having a festival is you get to meet. He was him. special. Yeah, yeah, and he was really special. Yeah, love to be at all the parties and hang out and talk to people. Yeah, you'd have to be like, Al, oh, I'm tired. Let's, you know, and it's like, well, you can go home, but yeah. that's right. I'm staying here. <laughs> you can go home, but I'm staying at the party. Yeah. So. All right. He so was last a thing, bon vivant. Before we go on to the film, um, you know, um, so your father was one of the Little Rock Nine. Yes, it is one of the Little Rock Nine. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Is he's, so, he's still so, very much with us. Yes. So I'd be really curious what he's been thinking, saying, and talking about, like in the last week and over the last few, you know, few years about what's going on, because, you know, he has a very different perspective on this than most people from his sense of history. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, totally. Um, well, I would say, first of all, he's a genuinely hopeful person. And I think that's, you know, in great part, what got him through the experience mm -hmm. of Central High, which was, you know, they were under, you know, mortal threat, you know, um, the entire time they were um, desegregating, you know, Central High School in Little Rock um, in, you know, 1957. So it was a very, very dangerous um, situation. I think his, um, I, 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 it's hard to imagine how he would have done so well without that positive attitude. So I think he's very hopeful and positive. Um, that said, I think, you know, really we started kind of talking about, I think Ferguson was kind of an inflection point. And I remember having some conversations in 2014, mm -hmm. initially really having some conversations then about um, how much what was going on, especially around the police, reminded him of you know what was going on then, and their interactions uh, you know with the police vis-a-vis -vis, um, that experience around Little Rock. So you know I think um, you know it's been hard for him as many people you know um, to kind of see this um, these kind of steps you know backwards if you will or these things that are so unresolved. But I think you know he is hopeful. I you know I think many as is the case with many of us, you know, um, you know, Tuesday's night's verdict was like, you know, I mean, it's not everything. There's so much work to be done, but that was important. Um, that was really important that that happened. And, you know, and I think, you know, our recent turn of events around electoral politics and the national stage, I think has left him, you know, more, more hopeful, but, you know, I would just say it's, you know, it's incredible just the reverberations and, the cyclical nature of all this. And, you know, I just, yeah, I mean, what can I say? Like, I mean, two things like critical thinking skills and like knowing our history as, as Americans, because we just keep repeating, like, you know, there, for example, there are people in Little Rock to this day that are alive, you know, that are quite, you know, older, but that were alive then or alive now that to this day believe the Little Rock Nine were communist plants. So this kind of fake news conspiracy theory thing, it goes so far back. It's not new, you know, and that's just always floored me that that was the case. You know, and I can say, you know, um, for sure that my father is not from Russia and yeah, so. Well, my grandparents came from Hungary, but that's not the same. Um, so um, thank you for that. It, it's really wonderful. It's not. It's nice to have someone with a connection of that history, which is very important and profound for us to remember. Um, so let's talk about this film. It's just what we're here about. So my first question is having like. So to be honest, I didn't. I have not seen this until a couple nights ago. And it's it's really incredible. Thank you for moving us in, in, oh, cool. in this direction. And and um, it's it's a part of the music universe that you know I'm an old person, totally unfamiliar with. So my first simple question is, what is the difference between this new director's cut and and the original? What 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 has been added to this? Yeah, it's it's um, it's a bit longer. I think it's um, ten plus minutes longer. There are a couple of different, I think there, there are also um, one or two tracks, mm -hmm. uh, you know, songs that were added. And then 
the um, version that's on the Criterion channel that will be there through February 2022, so a full year from when it went up, uh, February 2021, is remastered um, and has some color correction, some sound remastering. But the initial, uh, you know, 30 something minute film that was released when the album was released, um, you know, came out and then Solange, re and that came out uh, in this really incredible, beautiful moving way where it was premiered throughout various black owned establishments in Houston. Yeah. Um, and that was really cool. And then the director's cut um, premiered, I think at the Tate Modern in the UK. And then it was at the Museum of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. And then we showed it after that in Houston Cinema Arts Festival at the Deluxe Theater. Um, and yeah, and so this, this Criterion Channel re-release is celebrating the two year anniversary of the director's cut, which came out in 2019, following the initial version. So it's longer, it has, you know, some more parts to it. Um, it's her version, you know, it's, I'm assuming a version that, you know, um, as is the case with director's cut, right? As, as opposed to probably the labels version or, you know, the powers that be kind of probably wanted something a little shorter. So mm -hmm. that's my understanding. Um, well, I mean, she she directed and um, edited this the, the original version herself as as well, and it's pretty amazing uh, undertaking, and and so much connected to um, to to Houston. Um, the thing that f first I gravitated to um, was the sort of um, the sort of Afrofuturism, Sun Ra esque elements, um, which. Um, you know, you see pop up here and there in different kind of places, but I think it's really interesting to see such a beautifully glossy, extravagantly just amazing visual piece that sort of references the um, um, uh, the, the the Sun Ra material. And and I don't know if you, you know this, but um, I, I back in the day I was a um, I, I was DJ on the um, our, our college radio station, which was a uh, black jazz format, the Freedom Sounds in Philadelphia. Ooh, and so that sounds uh, good. W R T I playing nice playing black classical music. Mm. That was our line. Um, oh, wow. So um, being in Philadelphia, I got to see Sun Ra an awful lot. I mean, it was like he was playing every mm. week someplace. And um, and one time when I was on the air, Sun Ra just kind of walked in the station, sat down and talked for a little bit and just got oh, up wow. and left, <laughs> which was oh, wow. just an amazing, uh, an amazing thing. For those of you in the audience who may not know about Sun Ra, um, Sun Ra's name was, I think was Herman Blout, but um, he changed his name to Sun Ra and said that he came from um, planet Saturn and uh, played um, this incredible mix of jazz and a lot of other influences. Um, but he would have this incredible show that would be with them. There would be dancers and it was this, the Sun Ra something something orchestra or however he spelled it that particular day. And sometimes there would be 10 people in the band and two dancers. And sometimes there would be 30 people in the band and 25 dancers. And you never know what the experience was going to be, but it was going to be an incredible like multimedia experience. And you can see the sort of aesthetic of that within those scenes with the with the technology stuff and and some of the um, the sort of space like images um, that were really um, kind of kind of um, amazing but the other thing to sort of know about Sun Ra is he's the first pop musician to use electronic instruments I mean to use a synthesizer and um, and and to not just like play around with it a little bit it was like deeply involved in electronic music to give it that outer space kind of environmental um, sound. So um, so I think those kind of elements within the film are, 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 are really um, kind of strong. Uh, Jessica, how much do you know about the making of this? Um, and do you know anything about how it was made, when it was shot? Because it was all shot in Houston, I assume. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was shot in in Houston, um, and there were, you know, I, I, um, a lot of the local, you know, the like costuming and production crew. There was a lot of local folks that worked on that, um, including some, you know, costume designers that do a lot of work with um, 
different theater and you know dance companies and outfits in Houston. So it was a real coming together of you know local talent. Um, there also you know were um, kind of uh, black cowboy society you know wranglers involved that really you know kind of identified you know that talent right. That's such a huge component of it, right? Yeah. The kind of you know black cowboy experience. Um, so, um, and then, you know, Project Row Houses was involved, some of this stuff. Well, some of the album was actually recorded in one of the houses at Project Row Houses. So, so a lot like, of people may not know what Project Row House is. We, we have a lot of Dallas people here. Who yeah, really yeah. Into Houston, which is like a, an amazing thing, the Project Row Yeah, House. yeah. And I think um, the, what is it, Robert, um, the founder uh, of Project Row Houses was also involved uh, a bit in the film as far as I know. Uh, um, yeah, um, Robert Pruitt, I think was involved too, who started. Um, yeah, Project Row Justice is a really interesting project. It's a series of, um, you know, row houses, um, historic row houses in the Third Ward, historic uh, black community in Houston um, that have been just transformed into these um, art exhibition spaces, but it is like also just a incredibly radical project um that has that it has so much utilitarian focus and community focus their project growth has actually has created housing for mothers yes. in the community um they are very very focused on it they're actually doing a speaking of afrofuturism um they're doing a year-long reading like community reading of Octa octavia butler right now so that's a project that they're working on is like a year-long Kind of community engagement let's all read octavia butler together so that's interesting um and it's just a really really powerful project um that really marries um social justice with art in the tradition i would say in a long tradition of houston going back to the manils um yeah. that actually has a long tradition in houston the interest in social justice racial justice um and the marriage of that and um, fine art and the yeah. arts, you know, speaking of which we're in the 50th anniversary of the very first integrated art show anywhere in the United States, which took place at the Deluxe Theater in 1971. Um, and it was organized by Garrett Bradley's father, um, the filmmaker who directed Time, who's probably about to win the Oscar. Um, so that's pretty interesting. That was the first integrated art show in the US that was at Deluxe in Houston. So there's this incredible tradition of uh, a marriage of the arts and, you know, social history, social justice um, in Houston. And I think Solange is really tapping into that. She was really, um, you know, uh, you know, happy Earth Day, right? Today is Earth Day. Yeah. She was really speaking to um, Harvey. You know, she created this in the wake of Harvey and was really right. thinking about Harvey's impact on Houston. Um, you know, so that's apropos, you know, to today um, being Earth Day. And uh, yeah, and she's, you know, a student and a leader, right? I mean, you're talking about, oh, you know, kind of like new stuff versus old stuff, but there's so much, there's so much kind of historical knowledge that when I get home is rooted in. And there's so much understanding of, you know, the Sun Ra's and so many different artists. Um, you know, there's audio from, um, Felicia and Debbie Rashad, you know, uh, uh, Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad, who grew up in Houston. Um, there's so many, it's just, you know, as Toni Morrison said, all Black art is collages art because of, you know, the um, resources and the way, you know, that Black artists have to figure out how to create out of maybe not, you know, the most resources in the world. So, um, you know, this, When I Get Home is a great collages work of art. It is entirely postmodern and in conversation with Houston in that way, in conversation with Houston's various postmodern um, architecture identity, in co conversation with Houston's diversity. Houston is the most diverse city in the country. Um, it's one of the few cities that has a rising Black population. Black people are actually coming to Houston as opposed to many American cities, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a really, you know, and just going back to when you're asking about you know, my work, it's like Houston is the great sandbox to be doing this work because um, it's just, you know, it's so, it's so diverse. It's such a boom town. Um, it's such a complex place. And I think she's really tapping into that kind of traditionalism of Houston, the postmodernism of it, you know, all of these kind of elements, these complicated elements 
Um, and it's just, you know, uh, yeah, it's a love letter to um, black futurism. There's even some black pessimism in it. I would argue like, you gotta have a little bit of both if you're gonna survive in America, you know, you gotta have some, some black pessimism and some black futurism to kind of survive this uh, society and system. Um, and I think she's, you know, really leaning into to both of those ideas. And I mean, there's just so much to admire and talk about in this film, this visual album. I mean, that's the other thing is just the way, you know, content is evolving, right? We had the, you know, kind of concept album, right? For many years. And then we had the short form video, a music video, right? Mm -hmm. And then vis-a-vis -vis this and stuff like her sisters, you know, Beyonce's Lemonade. Now, you know, now it makes sense, right? This is the national evolution that now we have the visual album, which is like this feature kind of music video that, you know, that, you know, corresponds with the entire album. And that's really interesting to me too, the way this kind of um, represents the evolution of the music industry and the way, you know, music is being consumed now. We, we, we had some of those back in the 80s. Uh, I think uh, several bands, the, the um, ABC, several, several of them made these like feature length albums with, that are really visual experiences. Um, ABC would have done a visual album. That makes sense. I don't know if I ever, yeah. And and probably starring, um, what's her name from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, who was their muse. To but, uh, you brought it up, so I got to. Yeah, they, they, it was like they their were, major muse. <laughs> There, there, there were there were people. I mean, it was music video world, and people were trying to explore that. But, but none of these had like the the, the really incredible, beautiful visualization. I mean, some of them would have nice costume. But thinking of you're talking about the 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 all of the people working in the theater community, the the costumes were just so incredible all the way through. I mean, in each section, visually had its own unique look to it. And, you know, I, th I think in terms of like a community coming together for, you know, each bringing its own creativity, you know, in terms of cinematography and the lighting and, and the staging, I, I think is just really, and particularly, I mean, the, the costumes really stick out because they're so bright and, and powerful and dynamic and so much in, 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 as, as part of the of, of the foreground. Um, can you talk about the locations? Because um, I haven't been in Houston for a while and, and many of these places, I have no idea where they were. It's like the 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 um, the place with the kind of circle that, that you know you kind of see from above and sort of looks like a spindle in the middle. Um, wh where is that? Yeah, that was actually Marfa. Oh. And that, um, yeah, that was a um, sculpture, an installation basically right. that was created for for this project. So oh, that really? that stuff was shot in Marfa. Um, you know, some of the scenes with the oh, cow oh, somebody needs to turn off their, uh, yeah. put on their mute. All right, I got them, I took care of it. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, the, there's, a scene, there's a few scenes where, you know, cowboys, black cowboys are riding their horses. They're actually riding past the, Project Row House houses. Right. I, I saw um, that. There's a ton of stuff downtown. Um, you know, you know, amongst all of the incredible. I mean, like how? Yeah. I mean, I think already there's a sense of this. Um, you know, downtown Houston. I mean, most of it. Most of it was you know kind of built. Most of this postmodern architecture in downtown Houston was built post 1980. So it is truly like this mm -hmm. beautiful 1980s postmodern architecture. So many of those buildings are are used in the film, both the in you know interiors of those buildings and the exteriors. Um, so that's another uh, you know um, location. Um, there's some houses that are not far that are sort of in this area that I guess would be considered kind of in between or part of kind of the third ward where the third ward kind of bleeds into Rice University, mm -hmm. which is not far from, um, from what I understand from where um, they grew up, um, you know, mm -hmm. in Houston where uh, Solange and Beyonce grew up. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of kind of midtown third ward locations and then a lot of um, downtown, you know, postmodern skyscraper architecture, which I just think, you know, as time passes is going to, um, you know, the appreciation of this architecture is just gonna increase so much. And it's, you know, and that's, I mean, that, you know, and I, I the, look, I mean, with this, with when I get home, I mean, there are a few things I wanna say about it. Um, it. It really was my muse and my guiding light in taking on this project. You know, I, the first time I came to Houston was when I, I went to Houston for the interview for this job. 
So I did do a lot of research, but it was so unfamiliar to me. And this film was so grounding and so inspiring and just got me like so excited. And I just kind of keep coming back to it. And I just think it it's really um, a love letter to Houston, like on all of these incredible levels, you know, spiritually, visually, architecturally, culturally, you were talking about Sun Ra and kind of the mass of people. There's such a sense of black collectivity, right? In this film, there are so many scenes with all of these different bodies and faces and types and skin tones and styles. And there are just all these different ways that um, I think, you know, um, you know, just- And they all move in interesting and good ways. Yeah, and there's lots of circles. That's yes. the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, the visual the, motif. Yeah, but also the, what is it? The 30s, Betsy Berkeley, right? Oh, yeah. that, there, oh there's definitely a Busby, an influence, particularly the overhead shots. Yeah. Totally. Um, Big and, influence, yeah. And that sense of the ones in the hall where they're kind of moving, there, there's clearly, a, a, yeah, um, a, re a response um, to that. Um, and, and I think that is also really cool. And also um, seemed like there was at least one shot in, in Dallas in, the, in our city hall, which is also was in RoboCop. So oh, wow. city hall has- but Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, with the kind of, you know, cowboy lore and the kind of like, you know, it's just, yeah, it's just really finding this balance and really evoking Houston, which really does have this balance of the traditional and the postmodern. It is so futurist. It is so, it is so much a site of future America. I, I really, be, you know, believe that. Um, and I think, I think the film really does a good job of just kind of capturing that ethos and that balance, which is so, unique to Houston and maybe, you know, Texas overall. I and mean, then I think there's kind of a broader way that Texas is both, you know, kind of, you know, one foot in the past, but then very kind of forward thinking and futuristic also. And just this really interesting um, kind of, yeah. And then just the, you know, kind of frontierism, obviously mm. there's a way, yeah. And all the VR stuff in the film is really cool. Um, but the, 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 the cowboy image, I thought, was really powerful. I mean, it, 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 of all the images in there that sort of keeps coming through um, all the way and in different kinds of way. And in a sense, it's trying to uh, recontextualize the, 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 the white cowboy that we tend to see, the Marlboro man, the, um, the sense that we think of, of Texas, person and a horse and a gun and, and all of that. And it's reclaiming it in a really kind of cool way and recontextualizing um, that and kind of reclaiming it in a kind of way. No, totally. And and reclaiming it at a point that things were kind of, I mean, the, the point that that came out was also the point that Little Nas X's um, Old Town Road came out. I mean, that was a year where this kind of, this idea of the yeehaw agenda kind of emerged, which was all about, you know, this history has been whitewashed. I mean, mm -hmm. there's some research that is, I think out of Oklahoma, is you know, uh, purporting that the Lone Ranger was based on an African American cowboy. You know, so I mean, there's like you. This is an area where you talk about whitewashing. It's like yeah. you couldn't get more. You know, the, there's so much history of of black cowboys, Latinx cowboys, yes. cowgirls. You know, I mean, there's just this is a this is a really and what's interesting to me is that people in Texas know about this. Like, you know, I think it's people outside of Texas that don't really know the the history of the black cowboy. I mean, the conversations I've had with people in Texas, they're very aware of the history and the trail riders, right? Yeah. And and in Houston, like in various neighborhoods, folks really are riding horses down the street. Like it's not just in Solange's film <laughs> that this happens. This is actually a lifestyle. Yeah, like, I, you know? I have to say, I've been living in Dallas for a long time, and I have never seen anybody just driving a horse down a street. Well, you got to come to Houston because it's happening. I mean, in Fort Worth, I've seen it. Yeah, but, but that's but that's probably also like right the the black community and yeah. in Fort Worth and right it's back to the black cowboy. This is where these traditions are really, and a lot of these traditions are, you know, staying alive. Um, yeah. So one of my favorite sequences in this is is the um, the two sides of the street which um, I think musically is slightly different than everything else, but also thematically is just um, 
how I say it, it's more almost traditionally cinematic in the way it's like, it suggests a more direct narrative. Um, and I think it's just so evocatively beautiful about talking about the, the past and the present living in the same space. Um, and then the whole idea of sort of like the tree and be sort of becoming the tree, um, which sort of relates to the image at the beginning with the silvery thing. I mean, that it, that it really kind of, to me, is sort of the heart of the piece that all the other things have more visual splendor to them that are really kind of powerful. But this really connects the future and the past in a different kind of way. You have the kids, you have the old people, and, and you have that beautiful way in which we come from one side of the street and it's nighttime and we come over here and it's daytime and you've got the pool and then you've got the kids and that sense of, of, of time that, that is kind of magical in the way that a music video is, but also um, evokes a sense of story, a sense of people and a sense of life and a whole lives that we don't know about except that we see that they are lives lived. Yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah, it's it's really, it's just, it's just a beautiful film. I mean, it's both, you know, Afrocentric and cosmic, right? And yeah. that equals like, you know, um, Afrofuturism. And I think it's so rooted in an understanding of the opportunities of the region and the threats. I mean, it's not for nothing that it came on the heels of Harvey. Again, we're talking about this on Earth Day. Um, also want to shout out that yesterday was the fifth anniversary of Prince's death. And I feel like Solange is very post Prince also. Oh I think my. it's hard to imagine the aesthetics happening in her work without Prince coming along. Just a thought. Um, and also I saw Raquel put Concrete Cowboy in the chat. That is a great movie. I saw it. That's about black cowboys in Philly. Really interesting film worth, yeah. worth checking out and really shows how this, this story, this experience, these aesthetics really travel because comedy probably takes place in, in Philadelphia. Um, but it's, it's, it's really about this lifestyle and this culture. Um, and, you know, and there's something to it, man. Like I got, what I guess it was two years, it was like a year and a half ago when I was in Houston, I got up on a horse for a first time, you know, and there's that famous, famous line, right? From um, Blazing Saddles, yeah. or is it from Blazing Saddles about like, you know, liking being on a horse if you're black because you're up there <laughs> and white people have to look up at you. And like, you know, there's something to that. I mean, there's something to being on a horse, being that high up. It really is like empowering, you know? It's it's something, that feeling. Um, but um, but yeah, uh, I think, that, yeah. That there's something to that. I mean, think of all of the way in which the the, the cowboys that are riding have a look to them. You know, there is this sense of like being up high, kind of, um, I don't know, but there's that air, it's it exactly as you said, it's like, I'm, I'm up high above, I'm sort of floating above the reality by being in this. And, you know, there is a kind of, I wouldn't say it's floating because you're clapping around, but you're kind of above that, but it does really have that sense of a look, yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, the other thing that I think, obviously, it's so clear that she's centering and it's so much a part of her work is, you know, the power of Black women and and a kind of, you know, sex positivity in the aesthetics, in the performance, a kind of celebration um, and, and relishing of that at the same time that multi-generational Black women are being celebrated and you know, multiple, you know, body types and skin tones. And there's all these sort of, you know, kind of sly, kind of interesting, subversive kind of references that one piece where all of the dancers have like blonde wigs on. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, yeah, we're going to do what we want. We can do this, we can do that, you know, and that, that, that freedom is there, that kind of open road mm -hmm. um, for one style and, and one subjectivity and one's femininity and sexuality. Um, I think, you know, it's, as much of it's a love letter to the Black collective, the Black American collective, Black Houston, it's, it's definitely a love letter to Black women. Um, so yeah. There, there are a bunch of uh, people in there who are unknown to me, but I think there are people that are, um, you know, celebrities. Can, can you sort of go through who all these people are for the um, 
old white people. Oh, the people there. in the, you mean in the film? Yeah, the guest, the guest appearances. There are people here. Yeah, yeah, there. yeah. Well, okay. I mean, there are a few things. Um, I mean, uh, the music video director, Alan Ferguson, who is actually Solange's ex, he was involved in the making of this film. Filmmaker Terrence Nance. Yes. Um, from Dallas originally, right? Big, big, big fan of Terrence, yes. Yeah, yeah. He was he was also um, a filmmaker that weighed in. Um, uh, Jacoby Satterwhite, who is the, um, you know, put together those really interesting kind of, it reminds me of kind of like VR or like 90s style animation. And, yeah. and I just, I don't know, I'm sort of like obsessed with that kind of aesthetic that I feel like is, kind of emerging right now that's very kind of like 90s geocities but then it's happening now and just has a very like you know retro future everything old is new again right. um that's really interesting with the kind of right the the chairs the huey huey p newton chairs behind everybody right. in that animation um and you know i'd mentioned that um and then yeah as far as artists also the incredible autumn knight who's a houston-based performance artist now lives in new york she she's part of it um you know, Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad are um, kind of their their audio is is used at one point. You know, they're incredible, um, legendary. You know, uh, African American Houston Tonians who you know grew up in Houston a little bit earlier than um, Solange. Um, those are some of the artist um, features, and and um, yeah, and I think the other thing to um, add is that you know when it did when it did premiere um, initially. Um, it premiered at um, the uh, hair salon that her mother used to own, which is pretty interesting, and um, Unity National Bank, which is the only Black-owned Texas banking institution that I believe Solange has um, invested some money in. Mm -hmm. um, I did some research on that, which is interesting. Um, and then Emancipation Park, um, mm -hmm. which was you know, the only park open to African-Americans in Houston during the Jim Crow era. Um, the Ensemble Theater, where we where we showed it in the festival, was the only movie theater open to African Americans during this era as well. And Emanci Emancipation Park is really interesting. It was actually um, developed by a group of African American businessmen in the 1800s, and that's really where Juneteenth kind of took off mm. in the Emancipation Park celebrations at the end of the 1800s. And they developed it themselves. They bought that they wanted to develop a park that their neighbors and their community and their families could go to and they did it on their own. So, you know, he's, and it's like, I mean, it's also just interesting to me that there are all these places that the film could premiere. You know, I'm from New York, right? And right, Texas is complicated, Houston is complicated, but <laughs> it's like the opportunity for like entrepreneurship. Like, I yeah. don't think you could do that in New York. I don't think you could identify, you know, that vast amount of black owned businesses to premiere a work like this because capital and real estate being what it is, but Houston, you know, for all of its complications, is this place where people can do these things and develop businesses and immigrants and black people. And like, you know, I mean, part of it is the crazy zoning laws, but yeah. it's also just, there is this openness. There is this ability to, to do things. And I think she's also tapping into that, you know, that kind of um, entrepreneurial spirit, that kind of openness, that ability to create your own space in a way that I think places where capital is king and it's harder to get in there, you know, there isn't as much opportunity. So Houston's this interesting place in that way too, where there is all this opportunity for underrepresented peoples to to do things and thrive and create businesses. So um, can you talk a little about the um, the way in it, these early performances were in these spaces, these, these local community spaces. And like, if you know, if you were at one of those things or know somebody who was at that, and how like watching it there was different than say watching it in the museum at, at, at uh, Museum of Fine Art in Houston or at, at a movie theater. I mean, because these things are, are, are beautiful. The film is beautiful, it's evocative. And, you know, I would imagine some people in a smaller environment would get up and dance and react and respond. Whereas you're showing it in a music museum, people are probably sitting down and sort of politely applauding. I mean, how how were those events? Because I assume you you were aware. Yeah, of no, I, I mean, I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't there, but I got some feedback. Also, um, the Ensemble Theater was also a location. Um, I mean, they these were you know locations where the film was screened. I I know that um, Solange did introduce the film at you know some of them, and you know was in town and was able to kind of 
you know, bounce around and introduce it. Um, I think it was really, you know, powerful and moving. The ensemble is uh, um, uh, um, enjoying their 45th anniversary this year. Another example of kind of what happens in Houston. Um, it's a um, black owned, operated, they own the building, everything, theater company um, that is celebrating their 45th anniversary this year. Um, so, you know, pretty cool. Um, also, I just want to add, because you were asking before, I have to let my other notes. Yeah, there are a lot of, um, on, on the music tip, a lot of people, co-produced by Pharrell Williams, featured Playboy Cardi, the rapper Playboy Cardi, The Dream, um, and yeah, those are some of the artists. So yeah, Playboy Cardi, The Dream, and Pharrell Williams. Um, I think Tyler, the creator, was also on some of it as well. Um, I think he's on some of something, one of the tracks as well. Um, Um, so what else, what, what do you want to talk about? You have some, you have, you've got notes. Um, well, let me see what, what else didn't we get to? Um, yeah, I mean, there's just so many, uh, you know, that the Afro Cobra collective is also an influence on the film. This is an arts collective, um, from the, I believe the late sixties that, um, Solange was very influenced by. The Afro Cobra Collective, that's also an influence on, on the work. Obviously, the space face and NASA, right? There's that interesting right. moment with the photos of the Black astronauts, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, NASA's always there, right? When we talk about Space City, it's always there. Um, we talked about Busby Berkeley, that influence. Um, and, uh, and then also, yeah, I mean, the other, you know, that um, the other, I mean, now that's sort of, in the air and, and haunting it. I mean, you know, George Floyd was from the Third Ward and actually had um, cut, had done a, a record with, um, you know, at least a song, if not a whole record with DJ Screw and, and was part of the Screwed Up Collective. Um, that's very much an influence also here. Um, DJ Screw who uh, died uh, in, well, we just, 2020 was the 20th anniversary of his death. Um, and, um, he had died from an, an overdose of um, uh, codeine, um, which is um, kind of became part of the culture, if you will, um, kind of uh, recreational codeine use. And it was um, in, you know, during recreational codeine use uh, in the 90s that he developed this DJ style called Chopped and Screwed, where records are Chopped and what? Down, chopped and screwed. Mm -hmm. where records are slowed down and then also, you know, cut up a lot, right, by a DJ, huh. like, you know, the songs are cut. That's a big influence on um, when I get home musically. They're in both the editing style, there's a chopped and screwed influence in the huh. way the visuals are edited. And then also in her um, vocals, there's a chopped and screwed style to her vocalization. Um, it's like huge for Houston. I mean, basically, you know, this is an example of, of just, you know, how, I mean, basically he, you know, was an, an avant-gardist. I mean, mm -hmm. how avant-garde hip hop can be. He really invented this, this new style that has so much influence today. Um, and we just had the 20th of his death. Um, July is the 50th of his, uh, his 50th birthday is coming up in July, rest in peace. I mean, to show kind of how important he is, there is um, a movement now in Houston, there are people working on he had this um, blue, I thought I want to get the car right. Um, I think it was a Chevy, this car that was really famous that people are um, raising money to have it restored, you mm. know, in celebration of him and the 50th of his birth. Um, and uh, that's a really, you know, kind of interesting intersection and influence on Solange and on the, the film and her music. I mean, how do I explain this? I mean, being from New York, it's like, you know, <sighs> this music was not getting played on like, you know, mainstream commercial radio. So there was this way in which Houston and was not getting, you know, nationally kind of being recognized, right? At least at that point, I mean, now Southern hip hop, hip hop, mm -hmm. you know, has taken over. Like, you know, it, you know, went past New York a long time ago. But at that point, you know, it was really, people had to create this for themselves, create it for their communities. It was not, you know, it was kind of just for them. So the, and what happened, it, you know, is what happens in these situations sometimes, then it, this is complicated, right? That when that happens, cultures can sometimes flourish and develop in these really interesting ways when they're kind of left alone, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. people have to rely on themselves. So, I mean, that the whole kind of 
Houston hip hop trapped and screwed movement is also kind of em emblematic of this very entrepreneurial localized kind of scene. Um, and this is, you know, this is the kind of terrain that Solange was a little kid in. This is the world that she was, you know, a child in and then kind of watching her sister do her thing and going on tour as a backup dancer with Destiny's Child and all these things are kind of influencing her. You know, she's having these early experiences. She's like on tour with Destiny's Child, seeing the belly of the beast of the right. industry, which I would argue is part of the reason why she kind of went her own route mm -hmm. and did things in her own way because she saw, you know, kind of the other side and was like, oh, I'm going to create my own lane. I know what this big kind of juggernaut beast, you know, of an industry is, but um, but you know, also gave uh, her confidence to to direct something like this, which is totally, no totally, small totally. undertaking. Yeah, and I and I think the other thing I would I would add, I mean, in terms of what I want to share, is that I think what's important. What okay, this is the other thing that I love about it, and I feel like why it was such a kind of guiding light for me in terms of um, programming. You know, doing programming in Houston and and the Houston Cinema Arts Society, and um, thinking about Houston and just broadly like my kind of values and orientation. I think it's just. Um, you know, there's such an appreciation of, of high to low in this work. I think Solange is somebody that is really, has a deep sense of regard for, you know, everything from like, you know, high art to, right. you know, street, 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 street culture. And I, to me, this is one of the best examples of a piece of art that is celebrating that range. And that goes back to how she was raised and the kind of, you know, black art that she was exposed to and you know the exposure that her parents gave her, and I mean, this was a home that um, was you know very literate and very cultured, and she was exposed to a lot, and then also was exposed to all of this quote unquote like street hip hop culture. She was she played Glinda the Good Witch in the ensemble production of The Wiz when mm. she was a teenager. So there were just so many you know I I just think that like all of these orientations, all of these literacies are just getting thrown into this pot. And then what's coming out is just so multifaceted, so postmodern, so kind of on point, I think, around where we're at culturally and the kind of, you know, kind of blips of culture. I mean, there's a lot of kind of short form things happening right in this work. Mm -hmm. um, it's more impressionistic. You know, it is a, it is an album. It is a but the music critic Ann Powers has talked about how this is like an album for now. This is what an, a concept album looks like now. Yeah. That's coming out of this internet age, the SoundCloud age, this YouTube age, this Twitter, this, you know what I mean? That kind of, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But, but and that it's long, not TikTok long. age. Yeah. Twitter things are usually really short, short attention span, but this carries your whole attention span. But each chapter is so visually rich. But it's so many moments. It's like right. all these right. moments. And the album is like that too. It's kind of like, it is really reflective of kind of how far postmodernity has gone, you know, this kind of deep dive now that we're in, you know, of, of just kind of postmodern experience in art and culture. Um, so uh, one question I have to ask you is why the DeLorean car? I mean, there's just- DeLorean car because back to the future or black to the future, if you want to say, black. you know, it is that, I, I mean, that's my theory anyway. I, I don't, you know, I don't know for certain, but I'm, I'm assuming it's a reference to, that was the car in sure, that uh, is back to the future. the car from back to that's the future. That's the car, right? And that's how they get to the future. Yes. And again, like if you're kind of hearkening Harvey, kind of dealing with all of this, you know, these threats, right? It's mm -hmm. like, what is, what is the, what is the option? It's like the future. <laughs> Let's just like beam into a better, you know, Kind of, you know, and that's, you know, again, that kind of push and pull between Afro-pessimism and Afrofuturism, and just that need to kind of, you know, ex uh, explore those poles as a Black American for your survival. <laughs> so I, I look at that shot and I think, where could they find that many DeLoreans to be? That's a lot of DeLoreans, right? Yeah. And get them all into Houston. Like, where did they get them from? I didn't know there were that many DeLoreans left in the universe. Yeah, that's a lot of DeLoreans, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was a big undertaking. There was, you know, she has her, her company is St. Huron and it's an incredible company, um, you know, and she has a, a staff of people working on these projects and yeah, has, you know, like you were saying, you know, all these experiences kind of set her up to lead in this way and direct. And I think, um, yeah, she's kind of, you know, benefited maybe a little bit being the younger sister, kind of, you know, being able to see what, you know, watch her older sister 
kind of grow and develop and um and then having this foundation with her parents and and like the salon that that her mother owned really was like the center of black so she was at, at, at this kind of center of black houston society growing up you know at the salon that her mom has so there's just again there's just so many layers of access and ideas and literacy and understanding going on here i'm, I'm just sort of in the, just saying the word you know salon growing up you you tend to think of of the, the the male bonding place where people go to the barber shop and they hang out and that's where culture goes from generation to generation but in the salon is the same sort of thing except yeah that, totally maybe in a salon I, you hang out longer because it takes longer to get your hair done yeah and i think that confidence and that appreciation of you know black womanhood is is rooted in these experiences of being around all these you know multi generational black women and that's I think that's a big part of you know what she's working with here. So um, does anybody here have a question um, about anything? Do you have any sort of? Uh, we have Marion wants people to know about this exhibit. Let me see if I can click on this link. Do you know what this exhibit is here in the chat? Slowed and throws records of the city throughout muted and mutated land. Oh, yeah. Thank which, you. Mary. Which you were yeah, talking that's... about February 24th to April 25th. And yes. this is in the Contemporary Art Museum of Houston. This is something you would have to be in Houston, or is any of this three more days? Virtual? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, you'd have to be in Houston. It's only up for three more days. I saw the exhibition, it is incredible. It is, they did such a good job. It's so phenomenal. If anybody can get to Houston over the next few days, or if you're in Houston, it is so worth checking out. Um, yeah. So, um, so what else are you working on personally other than through the Houston Center Art Society? What are you, are you working on another project? Um, I'm working on, yeah, some stuff on this side. Uh, I don't know how much I should talk about any of that stuff, but I um, have some side projects, you know, to be determined. I'm not sure I'm ready to talk about that yet, but um, a lot of, you know, just a lot of really robust programming um, in the spring, going into the summer um, for the Houston Cinema Arts Society. That's going to be in incredible um, and really excited about that. And I think it's, it's like, it's at a time when people are wanting to go out. And I think that, you know, by summer we'll be able to actually, be in a shared space. And uh, I went to a, a film festival last weekend in a movie theater. It was kind of sparsely attended, but it was just so magnificent to be in a room with other people watching a, a movie together. And I think that, um, that the summer and the fall is going to be a great time for us to be uplifted by, because um, we've all been looking at our screens. It's time to like be together looking at bigger screens. And you know, sort of connecting to community because that's yeah, what totally. Are. What did what did you see? What was the movie that you saw? Um, so I saw um, it was this with Earth X. It was a film about uh, swimming with sharks. Oh whoa! Um, about this woman who um, like thought it was good to swim with sharks, and she actually advised on the Jaws movie, which then huh. turned to be the thing that made oh. everybody fear sharks more yeah. than. Everybody which is not at all what you wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, but she's like lived a life trying to promote uh, people sort of paying attention to sharks, sharks in a good way. Um, and then there was this Czechoslovakian film festival, uh, check that film, which is in Austin and Dallas. And oh, cool. so I, I went to see a, a Czech film. Sharks um, like being like massaged, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of shark massaging videos on YouTube right now. It's fascinating. <laughs> Apparently they're not as mean as everybody thinks they are. So. Well, there are only like a few sharks that actually will bite you and you can yes. put on this metal stuff so that you can actually won't get hurt with that. Mm. And indeed in this film, you see her kind of like, like bumping up against the sharks yeah. and playing with them. And they're, you know, yeah. really kind of cozy. They're it's like the cats of, they're like the cats of the ocean, you know? Yeah. Except, yeah, except like they're the uh, the lions of the oceans because yes, they no, can totally. bite you. the big cats of the ocean. Right. So we got we got my little cat here who could bite me as well, but wouldn't be that. No. Big. 
Well, Jessica, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank for you. It's fun. <laughs> time with us. Um, this yeah. was just so wonderful. I think the um, the Houston um, uh, um, what was a tourist commission would love you. You you sell the city in a completely different way than they would sell what the value of of Houston is is. is. But I mean, from a cultural perspective, you really did an incredibly great job. And you didn't also mention that with all of those organizations, uh, Swamp was very important in that, particularly in the early days. And James Blue, and totally. he was doing as well. And that um, yes. that, that is That's part yes. of, 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 of that, that history. Yeah, no, totally. The work he did and the work that Marion did with Swamp. Oh, Marion. For, but yeah, no, yes. Swamp is really important. And this is the 50th anniversary of the Texas Film Commission. So, so yeah, we're going to get into all this stuff in the festival this year, and we just want to celebrate the region, and it's just, you know, such such an incredible place, and thank you, and hopefully we'll get to work together on some stuff moving Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. Get some yeah. Dallas-Houston stuff going. Yay. Um, yes, I am all for that. Helps Absolutely. that high-speed train happen faster, because when that happens, forget it. It's on. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, Bart. Just wait. <laughs> it's, I've been wanting that for a long, long, long time. It's going to, that's going to, forget it. Look out the rest of the country when that high speed Houston Dallas train happens. Yeah. Shh. yeah we, we could stop in in Austin and say, you know, work with them too. It's a lot of good stuff happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure, sure. <laughs> Why I not? Don't know. No, good people in Why not? Austin. Yeah, for sure. Good people everywhere. Yeah, no doubt. Austin's great. Well, okay. this this has been really wonderful, and and thank you. I, had you not suggested this, I would not have experienced this film. So thank you very much. Yeah. it was. Uh, yeah, and everybody check it out. It's on the Criterion Channel. Yes. Um, for the next like year, basically. So check it out. It's great. And you could get two weeks of the Criterion Channel for free. You can always cancel it, but you could if you're too cheap to buy it, you can at least get it for two weeks for free. But it's like. There is no better screening service that has films you absolutely need to see. Like yeah. everybody has holes in their film history, totally. the core things, and they're all there for you to uh, to experience. So while you're still staying yeah. at home, the Criterion Collection is a way to um, you know get you caught up. Totally, the new video store, no doubt. Um, thank you so much. It thank was you. Uh, it was great to spend an hour with you. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's yeah. great about your father. Uh, that, oh. That's wonderful about him. Oh, thanks. Little Rock Nine. Wow. Yeah.